process, it can regenerate. So I think for every single philosophy of occlusion, the concept of regeneration, just like a one we make an onlay to, re to, to reestablish some wear and tear of the enamel into the joints, this can be something really magnificent. So that's what is Alejandro. Perfect. Let's move on. With. Let's move on to uh, Dr. Veng Chu. Yu Veng Chu is a good friend of ours. Yes. So Wen is coming from Singapore. So as we say, people all over the world. Dr. Wen and, I, and us, we have many uh, a training in common in the areas of neuromuscular dentistry, physiology, and craniocervical spine. And Dr. Chu also has been working a lot in the concepts of linguodontics, as he call it, that has to be with freedom of the fascias and working with phrygenidiotomies and knowing how the body can be free when we make the proper analysis and we learn how to integrate this in a normal workflow. And the importance of vagus nerve uh, yeah. for sleeping. And so, yeah, it, it really interesting subject and he's very well versed at it. Um, let's talk about Dr. Uh, Chira, Dr. Dara Chira. So that uh, also, she's an amazing orthodontics. Uh, I met her as well at the Arnett group. What impacted me about Dara is that she treats a huge amount of teenagers and she has a really comprehensive plan that involves full body workflow, full body therapy. She works really nice with physical therapists and also they make an amazing team with Jeff McLaren in the part to make appliances and they always look in an interdisciplinary treatment. So I seen them both working together and that's why I invited them both. But Dr. Darach has too much experience uh, into orthodontics and I think she combined it really well with the orthopedic part that is really valuable. Fantastic, fantastic, excellent. Next one is uh, Dr. Uh, Marian Evans. Yeah, Mariana Evans, I have the opportunity to meet her in Chicago two years ago when we were uh, lecturing for Academy of Equilibration Society. And we were lucky to have Dr. Dawson in one of the last lectures to be with us and also Dr. Orkeson for me. And I think for us that we treat physiological dentistry, that was a beautiful opportunity to be able to show the biggest brains in occlusion what technology can be these days. And we were so glad that it was really well taken. So Mariana, what I like about it, she has an amazing data. She's an orthodontist, but also a periodontist. And she's been developing workflows for rapid maxillary expansion that most likely we have the experience, so that's what we learned in dental school, that it just happened in kids. Now with the deficit that we have in facial growth and developing people, I think this sagittal expansion is really amazing and you will blow away when you see the amount of space that she can create and how she get to manage all the periodontal tissues and how she proceed with the ortho. Fantastic. It's fascinating. I think applies for everybody. Let's, uh, let's move on to Cyril. Cyril Gallard. Yeah, he's a good friend for France. We met about... 12, 13 years ago in the United States, taking courses in neuromuscular dentistry. And I get to follow him for many, many years. And something that always attracts me is because he's been of the top representing of neuromuscular dentistry with a top level aesthetics. Sometimes many of the questions that we have in neuromuscular physiological occlusion is that the aesthetics are poor, unfortunately. And then also sometimes that vertical dimensions are too big. So it's consideration. I think Cyril from the beginning, he marked a really good point. And what I'm curious to have him is because now he's combining techniques of neuromuscular dentistry combined with some of the principles of Professor John Coyce. So I'm really looking forward to see how he made that merge. Sounds great. Uh, let's move on. Uh, our next one is our, uh, our own mentor and good friend, Dr. Peter Farrow. Yeah, Peter Farrow, I'm who I am because him. I think <laughs> 19 years ago, he, I met this guy that was like a crazy for me. and He made me crazy or crazier or worse than him. He take me on over his wings and he tell sure me the, possible, the directions I have to go. And, and Peter was just amazing. So he's like a father for me. 
I bring him here uh, because I want him to tell us about his 40, 40 years of experience doing neuromuscular dentistry. So I think he's an authority and he gets to see how neuromuscular dentistry has different phases. Like everybody put a little bit of here and there, and, but still we're doing the same. So the Peter and he's, he's yeah. seen the evolution of, the, of, this, uh, of this field. Yeah, he started when was not training centers with the mm -hmm. first people that started this. So I think we deserve to hear Peter Ferro with the old evolution of neuromuscular dentistry over the 45 years of practice. All right, buddy. Um, we have gone through one line and we've beaten the way through 15 minutes. So let's oh, go a little wow. bit faster. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Gerardo Ruales. Gerardo Ruales uh, is a good friend from uh, Spain. Uh, has to happen that he's Colombian, but he moved to Barcelona, I think, like 45 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, he, uh, what I like about him is he has a huge influence in posturology and a lot of neurological connections. Uh, you will see how fascinating it is. But in addition, because when we post this, somebody say, you have people all over philosophy, but you don't have nobody for the Slavicek uh, or the Vienna school. And then he told me, he said, I was straight there. So I bring him as a friend and also to give him an idea about the philosophy of the Slavic Czech. Okay. All right. Let's, let's talk about Dr. Gutzman. Um, he's, a, he's a very, very interesting guy that I'm looking forward to listening to. Yeah. Dr. Lawrence, uh, I met him uh, also to the Arnett group. Uh, he's a guy that saved my life often because he's a scientist and he provides me all articles for scientific data every time that I want to lecture. What I like the most about him is his positive uh, attitude. Uh, people with the amount of resources in research as he has, he always is looking for articles that he make it work, that he make us think that he has uh, validation. And he's gonna talk a lot about uh, a connection with systemic problems into the temporal mandate mandibular joints and also relation of medications that can affect the temporomandibular joint that is I think part of my weakness we don't know much about that biological part so I'm really looking forward to, to learn from him. Perfect let's go ahead uh, let's talk about the, the youngest member Lucas. Lucas is the kid of the group uh, I think he's 30 something years old for Poland. Yeah, uh, extremely, he, extremely smart. Oh my god super smart he has an amazing community that he follow him he developed amazing educational programs all over the world what we have in common is we all have a background uh, trained by professor mariano rocavaro and he managed it beautifully in his office he has a team of physical therapists working inside but he follows the crucial principles of dr coys and we have many many things in common but also we have a few things that we do different and that's what we want to to, to learn from him. How is that thinking? With the problem? focus on the common, common grants. Um, let's talk about Dr. Lebert. Yeah, Emilio. Emilio, Emilio is an amazing French guy. I get to meet him because he was taking uh, our courses in the center in Dijon, France. But uh, Emilio has been trained by Dr. Legal, this French prostorontics for France that he's been writing books and been doing research in chewing cycle. And he write a book and an article that is called Canaan Guides, uh, Reality or uh, Meat. And I think uh, Emilio represents exactly about the philosophy of Dr. Legal to understanding the nociceptive and proprioceptive input in chewing cycles and how the engrams and the chewing cycles need to happen in the human body. So that's what Milio is going to share with us. Fantastic. Uh, next one is uh, Dr. Martinez. Dr. Domingo. Domingo Martinez. I think we cannot have a meeting talking about TMJ without inviting him. It's a huge uh, personality uh, in the renowned worldwide. He is from Spain as well. And what I like a lot, even that we have many different thinking process, is the manage that he does with the temporomandibular joint, the documentation. I think uh, the first time I saw him was like five years ago. Uh, we have different controversies over time, but at the end, we kind of seen that we have the same mission doing it, and then we end up also 
in really similar positions, but I really like, I think kids need to be an instructional person during the meeting because I respect so much the experience and knowledge that she has about the mandibular joint. Fantastic. Uh, the next one is uh, another very interesting uh, uh, clinician, Dr. McClendon. That, yes. Uh, the one that I'm... Jeff is an amazing guy. Uh, Jeff, like many of these beautiful guys I met in Arnett, he's a prostorontist in Manhattan. He uh, practiced with Dr. Levine. And Jeff is, I call him the lips guy because he honestly always has a consideration, not just the aesthetic of the lips, he's talking about the orbicular disorders, the bucinator and the attachment with the aponeurosis all the way to Bashan, what is called the vocal slim, that is something in the musculature that people doesn't talk much about it besides Rocabaro. But also Jeff follow a philosophy that is called OBI, and he worked with Dr. Dara for many, many years. They developed different appliances. I think it's called Mago. And then honestly, I won. I think Jeff is a great person and a great uh, exponent of this philosophy and definitely looking forward to it. Plus, that is a lot of fun, yeah. Tell us a little bit about Valentine. Okay, Valentine Precop is my partner in our center of Biofunctional Dynamics Academy in Dijon, France. Um, we have a personal relation. We've been working for two years. And the reason that I bring Valentine, because I think is one of the newest person in the, in the working in the philosophy uh, on TM treating, specifically TMJ, is because when he called me that he want to work with me, he say, hey, Javier, I get the same technology and the same equipment that you have. So now we can teach the courses has been two years since we teach about five, six different courses and we never get to use technology yet. So the point of view that I want to bring Valentine here is that he tells the story because he is helping now Dr. Baliati, Francesca, with complex cases that she doesn't want to treat. Uh, so he is getting enough experience and without technology because people think that we need the technology that we have to treat patients. And his story demonstrates that even though he has the technology, he's more focused in to be a diagnostician, to be focused to think in physiology, and that's what is being successful. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to Dr. Rick Robley, another uh, very interesting clinician. Yeah, Rick, antics for Arkansas. And Rick is amazing. I've been following him for quite a bit because he's one of the biggest leaders in clear orthodontics. And he is one of the top notch and he showed really comprehensive cases doing corticotomies. Uh, he has techniques that they make it and he follow up the cases that I'm seeing from him increasing airway and how he reduced the risk and the pressure to the root structures. And it's a really amazing technique. I think we all need to see it because I think patients deserve to have optimizations to the treatments and the time where we oh, have. Okay. Treatment. Next one, I'm going to tell you up front, do not spend 10 minutes on Dr. Rocabato. Oh, okay. I know how much you love him. I know we all yeah. love him and then we fault him. But let's try to keep it short and stick to the facts. Yeah. So have a, Mariano has been my mentor for 12, 30 years and we started doing research. He gave me the opportunity to be the dentist for his family. I did research with his wife and we've been really uh, trying to find new things. The only thing that we do is try to get together and then try to evaluate what we can learn. He's a really mentor to me because he doesn't know that he knows everything. He wants to look for more. He doesn't need more introduction. Okay, let's, let's make uh, the, the important thing. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rocabato is a PT, is a physical therapist. Yeah, he's a physical therapist. And he has, has been over 40 years of research on craniomandibular and craniocervical, um, you know, dynamics. Correct. He Correct. developed many of the concepts of craniocervical stability and became an authority to evaluate craniocervical dysfunction cases. Perfect. All right, next one is Dr. Runkin. Constantine, our good friend. Dr. Constantine is from Moscow, but he also has a practice in Boston. Uh, he is part of the International Court of Craniomandibular Orthopedics. That is an organization created by 
Robert Jankerson, the father of neuromuscular dentistry. And he's going to show you his way of physiological treatment into the patient. But also what I like is he also like a lot of research and he has a really nice research in patients with cancer and tumors that they have facial uh, maxillary uh, sections and how they can recover the musculature, harmony and balance. So that's what I like about Konstantin. Uh, really physiologic, great dentist, great leader in, in, in Russia. So Perfect. great with him. Fantastic. Next one is uh, Dr. Sutter, Ben Sutter, who uh, I met uh, last year and I was completely blown away with his lecture. Please tell us. Yeah, Ben is a good friend, physiological doctor. He's been doing uh, biometrics for many, many years. And he's been working in a concept about the timing of the seclusion of the teeth. So he's a doctor that understands the principles of neuromuscular dentistry and all the philosophies. But he developed a concept of primary care to check the timing of the seclusion because that can create nociceptive input into the cortex. Now, I'm really excited about the integration between the concept of bed solder with the concept of Francesca and the concept of Milio, because the three of them, they talk about excursive movements and chewing cycles and interference. Dr. Stutter make it with T-scan, and that's what is really good. He created a really good protocol, really to do it, utilizing T-scan to equilibrate the timing of the- Well, that's, that's another goal for our, uh, for our meeting, is to actually build bridges between these guys, uh, because sometimes they, they work independently and they haven't met each other and, and it would be great to create those connections. Now that brings us to the next one. I feel like uh, you've talked so much about Francesca that I already know her and I haven't even met her. So Yeah, it, don't ask me to be short in that one because oh, that is, uh, no, I love her, honestly. It was crazy because I need to tell this. I was, uh, we both like aesthetic as well and she was speaking at ceramic symposium for quintessence in hollywood and he finished a lecture of cases totally destroyed mouths and then all that i'm seeing is all these beautiful restorations and i noticed there was no traditional bite registrations taken into the patient because the mandible wasn't retrieved so as far as she walked out of the room i go fast behind her and i say francesca you didn't make central relation in these cases. You take this by differently. This looks like the way I take my cases. Let's go and talk. And that was five years ago, four years ago. And from there, we created a great relation. She went and took the courses with me in Dijon. So she understand what we talk about. And I think I give you a 10 points because she's spreading worldwide the knowledge of function, making the principle comprehensive, comprehensive that the human body is more complex, that is physiology, physiological, and in everything is all about function. She's an amazing in adhesive dentistry, uh, and then I can't wait that you guys get to know her. Yeah, I you forgot her. to mention that she, yeah. she, is, uh, she was trained by Pascal, um, and, and, and she's a huge, huge uh, authority on adhesive dentistry. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next one, which is another one that I'm uh, uh, really looking forward to, Dr. Valerio. Yeah. Patricia. Yes. Uh, Patricia is the only doctor that I don't have the pleasure to know her personally, um, but it has a special connotation. For me, orthopedics has been something really important because in Latin America, for us, we have a, strength, a stronger basis in orthopedics than in orthodontics. She worked with Dr. Uh, Wilma Simoes, who is one of my mentors. My initial intention was to bring uh, the professor Simoes to be with us, but she's a little complicated these days. So she say, let me send Patricia. She will represent the beautiful. She's an international speaker. She's been teaching the principles of orthopedics beautiful. all yes, over the world. A, a very uh, important point here is that uh, you know, we're talking about occlusion, but when does occlusion begin? And uh, and to me, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving f fast with children and setting them up for success in the future is extremely important. So that I, I'm I'm really looking forward. 
Yeah, she's going to put a concert that is beautiful because in Latin America, kids start being treated at four years of age and in America about seven or eight. So we're going to see what is the value to start treating kids at right. the earliest stage. So it's beautiful. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Now comes the next one is, is the most difficult of the um, interviewees uh, only because of the language barrier. But uh, hopefully we can pull it off. Gustavo, tell us about Gustavo. Yeah, yeah, Gustavo is an amazing guy from Argentina. Uh, he doesn't speak English, but it's so valuable the information that he has with us that we're going to accommodate because we want to steal his mind. Part of what uh, we like about him, he comes from the natological school, uh, just as a traditional prostorantics, but then he became a patient with cervical issues and neurological problems. And and he started going to osteopaths and physical therapies and posturology. And he started getting to see all these studies that they were doing and how he started getting better. And from that point, he involved a uh, concept of posturology. Also, he's a big believer in grow and development. So he, try, he treat patients all over, always with the orientation of posturology, but a lot into kid teenagers thinking in those important factors about grow and develop of the patient. So it's going to be fascinating to be here. All right. We're getting to the bottom of it. Um, let's talk about Dr. Walker. Okay. Robert Walker is a chiropractor. I met him about 12 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, he's a chiropractor that he talked about concept that is called craniodontics. He say, and the literature say, that the sutures are, the skull is not welded. We have sutures and we kind of flex and move and part of this uh, breathing happens inside the brain and all this dynamic motion is reflected into the sutures. Also when you have a malocclusion you can have the tendency to create cranial compressions so he developed uh, protocols to make cranial suture releases and he knows a lot about posturology but also he has really good ways to take by registration thinking in treating joints as joints, muscles as muscles, and a good combination of techniques. Uh, I get trained with him and pet Dr. Ferro, and I think it's really important. Just when everything was trying to be simpler, now we know that the, the skull it always also gets more complex, that. right? It's more complex, yes. Yes. All right. Um, the last uh, one is uh, our good friend, Curtis. Tell okay. us about Curtis. Yeah, Curtis is, uh, my God, I know him from the beginning that I started going to take training in neuromuscular dentistry. He is from Calgary in Canada, amazing dentist, amazing marketing guy. What I like about Curtis is also he developed workflows and techniques utilizing T-scan in combination with trans-electrical stimulation. And he developed protocols that combine the utilization of boats but he's doing a lot of studies with NUCA chiropractors. And it's important, he, what he's gonna share with us is how he benefits for interdisciplinary treatment and how he time out the relation with the chiropractors in the normal workflow at his, at his practice. Fantastic. All right, so we're, we're done with the first part and uh, some people are asking to speak a little bit louder. Um, Okay. So I'm going to try that. Um, the next thing that we wanted to do, so as part of our project, we wanted to create um, a sort of a framework of uh, standardized questions uh, that, uh, again, we put together with, uh, alongside with our uh, uh, feedback with some of our, our uh, interviewees. And uh, we thought there are some concepts that need to be addressed and questioned and talked about. So we're going to go through our uh, our uh, questions. Um, Javier, did you make a slide so we can have that option? No. Honestly, I, I, but I will do it today. Uh, okay. We Maybe have we'll, actually a few corrections to do. But it's okay. We will post up, post up the questions so that uh, the viewers can, uh, can uh, follow with it and, um, and, and see the train of thought. So, yeah, so technically we try to standardize the questions and what we're looking for you guys in the audience is that you guys can make notes and kind of start making some tabulations. Uh, ideally, I made this proposal to the uh, Georgia College of Dentistry 
with the Prosto students that now I'm part of the faculty and I'm trying to engage the students to help us to make a tabulation of the data that we call it here. So at the end of the day, what we want to see is how these people is treating, what they have in common. The main point is to find what they have in common because maybe that common denominator is a key of success. So let's try to find all those factors. Let's make tabulations and statistics. And then at the day that we're wrapping this content, we're going to be able to have more information. So that's correct. They, that's, they, that's they an important, I think that's an important point you just made that um, we all have successes and we all have uh, failures, but the important thing is to find out what are, what are they doing right and what are we doing right that, that we're getting those successful cases and maybe those common grounds can move us forward and, and bring the, the field in, into some sort of uh, uh, happy grounds. Yeah. Right. Let's, let's talk about the, uh, the questions. Okay, we're doing really good in time, Hamid. We have 30 yeah. minutes. It's not easy, no, but good. I am trying my best. Yeah, All right. we, we're good. Okay. All right. So All right. let's go with the first question. And please do not mix it with the next one. All okay. right. So what is occlusion for you or, you know, okay. you, and, and who has influenced you? So as, uh, just explain what, is, what was that question about? Yeah, so in this question, it's like as to start to get in an impression about the thinking process of the speaker. Um, many people can consider that occlusion is just related with teeth and they can master it. They can talk better than anybody else about contacts and tripodism and how perfect the, the occlusion pathways and everything has to be done. But it can be people that occlusion can combine occlusion and then the joints and then they're going to go deeper into that. And I think this is the story of most of the, the speakers and the guests is that for them occlusion, it combines many things because they have extensive training and the idea that we put this material together is that you guys maybe can see where they're coming from. So that's the idea of the first question. It's a really wide question, but it's just to get to have the sense to see and more occlusion in the natologic traditional way or no and more about the contemporary way just like Francesca or no and more holistic when I'm thinking about posturology, cervical spine, swallowing and airway. All right. So and that's what we were going to, have to the next question. Stop oh. it. All right. Yeah. So so basically we wanted to know where their influence. So then, then the second question is which factors do you consider um, before the stabilization prior to stabilization? Um, you know, such as those you were just mentioning. Yeah. Posture, so many people have been asking me what I mean by stabilization. Stabilization is that point of where you decide to take a bite registration and you expecting some recovery, healing or improving of function. We can have two phases of stabilization. It can be one prior to splint therapy. That is when we're going to make in the, diagnose, the diagnostic and then we take the first buy. We clarify the first buy that we take is not the last five buy that we take. And then can be when we're going to move for the restorative phase, can be another stabilization. Oh, so in see. both factors, I think is whatever else they take in consideration. If they interconsult the cases with another physician or what they consider need to be saddled before you move to a next step that we consider stabilization. All right. and, and that brings us to the third question, which is what type of information or diagnostic records do you obtain or do you collect? Yeah. And, and why? This is, yes, exactly. This is a good point because I think we to all pass through this evolution. I mean, we've been doing this for, I mean, you and I for 18 years at least. And then 18 years ago, we didn't take that many images. We were taking technically some cran uh, transcranials that was really difficult to see. And I think we evolution to tomograms and that was a little more clear. But now standard care is about uh, CBCTs. So now has been changing that utilization. In the meantime, we use many other instruments that even in sometimes we don't even use it anymore, like pharyngometers that we're trying to use for the sleep. And then it takes us time to know that the physiology was different and that's what we start using on other resources. So this is, we want to get to know uh, what is the right, physician. I think you just crossed into, into this. okay. Oh. So the next question is, is what instruments do you use and, and 
uh, oh. instrumentations to, to collect those data, such as MRI, jaw tracking. All right. Okay. Yeah. Movement. I'm showing. That's, what are, okay. That's what we hear. Okay. That's what you hear. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. So here with the instrumentation, as Hamid say, um, I post some videos the other day about dynamic MRIs because uh, I think MRIs can be an amazing tool, but I think it's difficult to have them, and mostly dynamic. So even that I think in TMJ can be important to have MRIs, I think we don't have access to it. But I think CVCTs are coming a standard. It's something that every office has. And also, if you ask me if this is about equipment, I will say not. The thing that you can use is just a cell phone to record videos, and then we will sure. go over all. Sure. So it can be anything simple to, to very sophisticated. Um, exactly. Then the next question is a big one, and I think uh, people should uh, start to see uh, the direction we're moving to. Uh, is do you use an interdisciplinary approach in your treatment? Yes. Yeah, that is also a common question that we have. That you say how you work the patients with your team. Not all the patients that come to the offices is directly related with pain, but based in the signs that we've seen, many times we find things that patient is not even aware. And in that point, that was, that's like I spoke about the seven steps of records, that information, the physical therapy can have it, and then they can tell us if that problem is ascending or descending primary. And I think okay. that's what is going to change the conditions, right? All right. Yeah. So the next, uh, the next is that um, if you have to establish a sequence, if you have to establish a sequence of treatment, what would it be? Uh, and, and to, you know, if we want to get it on a desired vertical dimension. Yeah. We're talking about this question because um, there's a lot again, of again. It's a lot of different factors and people that say that many physiological cases, they have vertical dimensions that they eat too big. And technically, that can be related because the relation between the car and the garage and the mandible, we always have in a conflict. So sometimes we take advantage of vertical dimension to catch up the swim back uh, because this is huge discrepancy between the two structures. All right, so, so we want to know if they're using, uh, if they're considering posture, just aesthetics, airway is very popular today, joint position, uh, and all those, those things, that, that's what we're after to find out what they're considering. Yes, uh, so um, the other thing that we wanted to find out is the facial consideration, facial aesthetics. So when do they, when do they actually consider facial um, aesthetics? Yeah. Honestly, I've been even, I even even learning myself a lot lately. Uh, as we know, I get inspired big time by Christian Koshman in facial harmony and facial aesthetics and three-dimensional uh, planning. And I think I, the missing point was to consider facial harmony in the treatments from the beginning. And what I mean with this, when you understand facial harmony, you can determine really well facial asymmetries, or you can see what is not nice into the patient face. Most likely, these factors are related with development of the face that he has an intrinsic condition of something that is started in a previous stage. Also, because when we do restorative cases, it's always important to know what is the position of that inside is alleged to determine a vertical dimension, even that that's not the vertical dimension that we're going to treat the case. But we technically take two vertical dimensions. One is to make an splint, and that splint needs to have a condition because the splint cannot break. So for the splint therapy, eventually we need to have some thickness. That's the difference between the both. Right. So, so, so let's, let's not get into details of treatments. Um, number eight. Are you aware of the benefits of the PRGF or IPRF to regenerate bone and tissue structures? Yeah, this, this subject is, is fascinating to me. I get exposed to this information uh, in details for the first time uh, two years ago through the professor Bruno Ardanza from Spain. And I saw him in Spain making a lecture. He has 20 years cases. 
and and he told me and he said the same way that you guys put an only to restore the wear and tear of that occlusion tables you guys need to think that the joints need to be regenerated and that will make a more conservative treatment then um, um you know alejandro Alejandro Martinez also is a big speaker about the subject, so that's why I invite Alejandro. The difference between the techniques in Alejandro and Dr. Eh, eh, Ardanza is that eh, one is making only the growing factors and the other one is making arthrosynthesis first. It's cleaning and making a debridation of the adhesion because we're going to take really advantage of a surgeon that can tell us that they made 500 surgeries because that is quite a lot. Beautiful. Beautiful. And, and he will say the value why he consider he's seen too many adhesions and that's why his techniques is combined with arthrosynthesis. Beautiful. Let's go on. Um, do you notice postural changes after your treatment? This is question number nine. Expected or unexpected, positive or negative? Um, this is a really uh, a question for the very astute clinicians that, that are really watching their patients. Um, so uh, being that we have a group of really great clinicians, we thought this is an important thing to ask. Yeah, I think that the, my message in this meeting, it will be that you guys at least collect enough data or enough picture or records about the human body in general. I was talking with Francesca the other day because she's gonna blow your mind away with the restorative cases that the patient has almost no teeth and she built up with uh, addition dentistry. And no root canals. No root canals, no post, just the pure Dr. Manier techniques or bonding and can just make it beautifully. But then I was saying, Francesca, how this patient looks like now? And now she says, I wish I took pictures of posture to see how they changed before. But I think changes, postural changes in what we do big time. And then sometimes I'm seeing changes that I consider that they're not as positive. Uh, one of them is most of the time when we bring mandibles forward too much, can be to twin blocks, or stretching techniques to take physiologic bites, or by maxillary advancement. The common denominator that I found is a little flattening of the cervical spine. The necks became a little kyphotic. Dr. Racabaro explained that to me, saying about that important connection between the costridium medial and superior pharyngeal muscles to the higher and to the chin. And he explained that it's two measures that they uh, distended but it's a limit. So to wrap it up into that point is, um, I want, since we have a lot of maxillofacial surgeons here following us for the IMA group, I was proposing them the idea to just to come back and take a look about some of those cases that they make um, by, by maxillary advancement. I just check the next before and after, and maybe this can be a some topic that we Perfect. can find more things. We're on, we're on the last uh, we're on the last fifteen minutes. Um, okay, let's go to question number ten. Um, this is a more of a philosophical question, and uh, it's, uh, do you consider that at any point the field will be open to a more holistic and holistic with a W uh, approach to occlusion, both more organic meaning and both from looking at the whole person and the whole body? Meaning yeah. And, and, and I think the, everything in life starts with something, with a belief, with a dream and a belief. And the entire why we're doing this in Potion is because we want that you guys get the opportunity to see the information for these speakers because they changed my life and they showed many things in common that has a physiologic thinking process. So I want that for this, my belief is I want to know how much the speakers are willing to participate in this revolution of education and to try to find out if in some point we're gonna have more standardization and we start fighting about occlusion and we start creating maybe protocols that they more optimize and more close to the real physi physiology of the human body that I think we violated it a lot. Beautiful. Uh, 
Fantastic. And, and the last question is uh, something that we felt we need to ask uh, everybody because it really goes to the fundamentals of uh, um, our beliefs. And can you do it, it is to the to the clinicians is can you describe the events that happen in the joint? Uh, specifically, we're talking about the rotation translation. And uh, where do they expect that the condyle uh, will end up at the end of their treatment? Um, do they have a specific position? Uh, what type of uh, occlusal scheme they're looking for? And, um, and, and, you know, what type of, you know, are they looking for? Um, okay, this, this question is, is, I'm excited about it because I'm personally, I've been talking really loud about that it doesn't exist, a hinge axis rotation. And I have uh, extensive data uh, that it shows cases with advanced jaw tracking, that it shows that the events that happen into the joint have different misinterpretations. And that, of course, is a strong literature based in research that doesn't necessarily wear cadavers. So the reason that you can see here in my background is because this is a case that I put just uh, uh, last week uh, about the comparison in two patients in natural, normal opening and closing. It's in my Facebook page, it's been in YouTube. And I want that you guys see, first of all, how is a reaction of the head also when the patient is making a mandibular opening, but also how is a totally translation into the condo. So we will talk in this question about osteokinematics and arthrokinematics of the synovial joints. And I'm really, really uh, expecting to have Dr. Rocabaro and all the other physicians trying to give us a description about these two events that they through controversial where people have been opening vertical dimensions in articulators because they assume that we function as a hinge axis, what in my way is some something that is not that way, let's say. And then we will validate. Well, again, we're, we, we want to learn and, and yeah. we're open to all uh, uh, trains of thoughts and uh, but mostly we're, in, uh, we're interested in, in science-based and physiologically uh, logical explanations. Uh, we're not uh, here to, uh, to create the con controversies and, and we want to truly understand and we want to learn and we can, if we can pick up some new things and add it to our protocol, we're absolutely open. We're, we're not ashamed of telling everybody that uh, we, uh, we steal minds and, and, and ideas. Exactly. We want to just, just to help us to, de to describe something that it can become a standard in that definition of what happened into the joints and maybe is mostly a description factor that we have. But this question has three, 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 three fundamentals, right? I think this is the question and we put this question at the end. That's why many of the speakers, they don't have it or any of the speakers, they have it. Because we start receiving uh, people asking, but where is your condylar position? Or do you think the condyl rotate and translate first? Or how is your occlusion? So, so we break this question in three factors. The first one is we want that help us, the people help us to make a description what events happen into the temporomandibular joint. We need to distinguish between arthrokinematics and osteo osteokinematics, so it's no confusion. So we will go deeper into that. Also, we want that the physicians, they determine by experience where they can describe that they finish the, the cases in which condyle position. Can be described, can you name it where it can be? Uh, because when I was doing a lecture the other day with people that we're supposed to don't have nothing in common with it, me, at the end we found that we end up in the same position and we say, this is like a, we fighting and having all these controversies and then you have your ways to take your bites. I have my ways to take my bites, but look where I'm finished, look where you finish and we almost the same. So I think this is what is beautiful to try to you describe modalities in the way that we do it, but we try to uh, unify the correct. Right. But at the same time, um, another thing to keep in perspective uh, for everybody, I want them to, to keep that in mind, the overwhelming uh, uh, 
majority of dentistry done out there, maybe more than 90% is done in habitual bite. So all this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, quarrel about our, uh, uh, you know, occlusion is among maybe five to 6% of dentists. And uh, many of them have a lot of successful cases. And it's time that we put this, these ideologic things away and, and look at the facts and look at the science and look at, we have instrumentation today that, that we can clearly track things. Let's use that and let's find the common grounds. That's, that's our message. Yeah, and the last point of that question, we're talking about occlusion as teeth getting together. Uh, in the prostodontic concepts, we've always been defined as stoppers, as stabilizers, and some mechanical uh, factors that when we're doing prostodontics, we have to take as a consideration. So we're talking about a little bit about that occlusion scheme. We're trying to see where you will put those contacts, uh, you will try to go for a cost force relationship, you try to look for cost interdental space, or you believe what you will do if you have a case that is edge to edge, what you have a case that has a class three tendency that they have conflict into the occlusion, how do you create those excursive movements, how do you create the freedom in chewing cycles, or what is that dynamic thinking process into that relationship between the teeth? Because that's what most people know about occlusion. And again, with all these questions, I think we're gonna have a sense about how people is being uh, considered occlusion, uh, thinking with a different mind. Fantastic. Well, Javier, we have done it, man. We're at the last uh, five minutes uh, of the, of the uh, initial meeting. Um, I don't know if you've seen any of the questions. Uh, do you find any, do you see any see. posing any questions for us? Okay, so in the meantime, we're looking for questions. So I'm going to remind you what is going to be your next speaker. So today, uh, we're going to be at 1 p.m. Because remember the logistic of this uh, event is we have in eight days of interviews, three interviews a day with all these magnificent speakers. Then we're gonna have the day, the 1st of May, 12 hours of continued lectures by these speakers. It's called the Occlusion Marathon. It's a gift that uh, we create because I think my information many times need to be free. We want to encourage you guys to start getting love in occlusion. So that's why we put all this uh, organization together. So Peter Ferro is gonna be with us at 1 p.m. And today we're gonna have at 6 p.m. Dr. Professor Mariano Rocavaro, two amazing physicians talking about physiology, uh, about the function and about friendship and love and beliefs. <laughs> thank you so much. Do you have something else to say? Uh, no, no, I just want to thank everybody and uh, hopefully they'll have enough time to join us again at uh, 1 p.m. To, uh, to talk with Peter. All right, guys, have a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay home, stay clear. I know that in these times, people already take a lot of continuing education and maybe people at this point is trying to create more strategies to see how we're going to start again. And maybe that has created a little anxiety. Um, but remember, the most important part is we have a huge people in the top of all of us. That is God. This is happening for something. We deserve to put a little piece of us because we deserve to make a better world for future generations. It's a commitment in all meanings. <laughs> so I will see you guys at 1 p.m. Thank you, Hamid. Yes. You're an Thank amazing you. moderator. Thank you for keeping I want to mention that during our practice, we never made it under one hour, and we did no. it now. They did it. That's, That's, it. It. That's good. <laughs> That's awesome. This all right. It's going to be really good. Thank it. you, guys. Love you all. Take Thank care. Bye-bye now.